Good afternoon. There's no coffee break, so we go straight to the next uh, session. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Eduardo Cavallo. I'm an economist in the research department. I um, personally can claim two successes in my personal relationship with Guillermo. I mean, he was my first boss. He actually hired me after graduate school. That was the first one, so the first success. The second was that he didn't fire me after uh, hiring me. So that's my second uh, success. It's really an honor, Guillermo, to be here. Thank you very much for the organizers, for, for the invitation, and for the opportunity to introduce this very interesting paper. Uh, so we have Marina Halak from Yale University. She will be presenting a theory of fiscal responsibility and irresponsibility. Uh, it's a co-author paper with Pierre Yaret here from uh, Columbia University. And then we have uh, Mark Aguiar as the discussant. So um, Marina, the floor is yours. You have 35 minutes. I'll tell you the, the time, and then we'll go to the discussion. Thank you very much. OK, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real honor to be presenting here in this conference for Guillermo. Um, so I wanted to say Giancarlo presented and said that he had written the paper in honor of Mori, and then he added uh, uh, the, you know, the relationship to the work um, uh, of Guillermo. And so we are very coordinated, because in this paper, we actually cite the paper by Mori and Guillermo together. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't plan this. Um, so this is a joint work with Pierre, who is here. And it's part of a broader agenda that Pierre and I have that is uh, very much in line with the subject of this conference and with the discussion that we had over lunch, in fact. Am I OK? Oh, OK. <laughs> um, so we have been uh, thinking about dynamically inconsistent government preferences, the credibility of government policy. And in particular, we have been uh, focused on studying the trade-off between commitment and flexibility. Uh, so over lunch, we were talking about rules versus discretion, uh, I guess partly motivated by the work that, I don't know where Ivan is now, uh, that Ivan has with Amador and Angeletos. We call it commitment versus flexibility. Uh, and we have studied that both in the context of uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. And so in this paper, I'm going to talk about uh, fiscal policy. Uh, our starting point is that fiscal policy in practice cannot be explained by normative considerations alone. So political uh, forces also play a role. And we can see this at different frequencies. Uh, at low frequencies, there is research showing that the historical accumulation of debt um, across advanced economies cannot be explained by normative models, but is consistent with political economy incentives that promote greater debt accumulation. At short frequencies, there is research showing that the accumulation of debt is correlated with the uh, electoral cycle and is also uh, correlated with the government's party identity. And um, what we're going to do in this paper is focus on fiscal policy at intermediate frequencies, so spanning multiple cycles. And here we also find uh, that uh, you know, fiscal policy cannot be explained by uh, contemporaneous macroeconomic variables. Uh, so in particular, there is evidence that the stance of fiscal policy exhibits history dependence. Uh, so for example, there is evidence that taxes and spending exhibit persistence above and beyond that of the GDP and the level of debt. There is also evidence that persistent changes in the stance of fiscal policy tend to be preceded by crisis periods. And in fact, in the paper, we cite some econometric analysis for the US that find that fiscal policy in the US can be characterized by two different uh, fiscal policy regimes, and that a negative output gap increases the chances of transitioning from one regime to the other. And actually, we can see something like this uh, in this figure that I'm showing you here. Uh, so I'm plotting here um, uh, US um, uh, uh, public debt as a percentage of GDP. And I'm uh, doing that uh, since uh, 1945, and the shaded areas are indicating uh, US recessions. And so what we see here is that following uh, the Second World War, actually, we don't see these different fiscal policy regimes. We just see a downward trajectory of debt to GDP. But things change uh, around 1970. So there are uh, three recessions between 1974 and 1983 where debt to GDP increases by uh, 38%. And so we now enter a period of debt expansion. So we have this period of debt buildup uh, that uh, continues through the boom in the 1980s under Reagan. And this goes all the way until we get to the recession and the first Gulf War in 1990. 
At this point, things are going to change. We enter a period of fiscal consolidation. We have tax increases and spending cuts under uh, Bush and Clinton, and so we see that this decelerates the growth rate of the two GDP and eventually turns it negatively. Uh, but this ends, of course, once we get to the uh, 2001 recession and the onset of the war on terror, at which point we enter a new period of debt expansion with an eventual explosion of debt to GDP during the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, but then again, we enter, after that crisis, we see that this triggers a new period of fiscal consolidation. Now we have uh, spending limits introduced by the Budget Control Act in 2011. So again, we see that the rate growth of the GDP gets uh, decelerated. But then, of course, we have another crisis, which is the pandemic, and we enter a new period of that expansion. We have uh, a historically large stimulus. And so what we see here is these different regimes. We go from periods of debt expansion to periods of fiscal consolidation. And so what we are going to do in this paper is provide a theory that can explain the presence of fiscal policy regimes. And in particular, we want to explain um, uh, these fiscal policy regimes that are punctuated by crisis periods, as what I, uh, I show you uh, in the post-1970s in the US, and as it is consistent with this empirical analysis that we cite. So in the paper, we are going to focus on the dynamic interaction between successive governments. These governments are going to be subject to fiscal shocks that are IID. But there are going to be two frictions in the model that are going to generate history uh, dependence. So the first friction will be that governments are deficit bias. So the government in each period will overvalue uh, current borrowing and spending relative to future welfare compared to society. And I'll talk more about this in the model. And the second key friction is that the shock that is realized in a period will be privately observed by the government in office in that period. And so what we show is that these two frictions, as I said, are going to generate history dependence. In particular, we are going to solve for the best equilibrium for society, so the equilibrium that maximizes social welfare. And we show that this equilibrium is characterized by two fiscal policy regimes, what we call the fiscally responsible regime and the fiscally irresponsible regime. These regimes sustain each other, so the threat of transitioning to fiscal irresponsibility sustains fiscal responsibility, and the promise of returning to fiscal responsibility sustains fiscal irresponsibility. Furthermore, we show that transitions between these two regimes occur uh, when there are high fiscal shocks that increase the marginal value of government spending, as it would be the case during a crisis period. And moreover, we also show that these fiscal policy regimes, these transitions, can only arise if the government's deficit bias is large enough. And so we use all of these results to provide an interpretation for the dynamics that I show you for the US. We think of these fiscal policy regimes as corresponding to these different periods that I show you uh, post-1970s. So we want to interpret periods of fiscal consolidation as uh, fiscally responsible behavior by governments that understand that if they deviate from that fiscally responsible behavior, they're going to set a bad precedent for future governments to overborrow. And we want to interpret periods of debt buildup, of debt expansion, as periods of fiscally irresponsible behavior by governments that uh, have a bias towards overborrowing and overspending in the present. And they understand that once the deficit becomes large enough, fiscal policy uh, fiscal responsibility is going to be reinstated. Now, of course, I also show you that before 1970, we didn't have these fiscal policy regimes. We just had a downward trajectory for debt to GDP. And so we can also use some of our results to provide some insight into what may be different pre-70s and post-70s. As I said, we find that these fiscal policy regimes can only arise if government's deficit bias is large enough. And there is a political economy literature that claims that Indeed, political biases have been increasing over time. And this literature uh, says that, well, maybe these increasing political biases can explain the rising uh, levels of debt across advanced economies. And so a key takeaway of our paper is that these increasing political biases may explain not only the uh, higher long-run uh, debt growth, but it can also explain the presence of regimes in fiscal policy. Okay, so that was the introduction, and um, I do have a literature slide, but I'm going to skip it in, um, uh, because of the time constraint, but uh, I apologize to all of you who are cited here. Uh, so let me now go uh, to the model. <laughs> 
All right, so we have an infinite horizon small open economy. Um, uh, in each period T, we have a shock uh, theta T that is going to be realized. As I said, shocks are going to be IID. Uh, this shock is uh, drawn from a bounded set with a continuously differentiable density, uh, F of theta, which is strictly positive for all theta. In each period, there is a government that is going to choose how much to borrow, uh, so that BT. And given the budget constraint, that is going to pin down the spending GT. And so I'm showing you here the budget constraint. Tau is an exogenous tax revenue, and R is the exogenous gross interest rate on government bonds. So what is welfare at time t? For society, well, society uh, will care about the discounted sum of the utility from government spending. And so u here is the utility from government spending. Delta is the social discount factor. And you can see how the shock affects the marginal value of uh, government spending. And so a higher uh, shock would mean uh, that we have a higher value of government spending, as it would be the case during a crisis. And we can write the social welfare recursively, as I have done uh, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, where I have Vt plus 1 being the continuation value. Now, the government at time t uh, has a welfare function that differs from society in two respects. The first one is that the government is going to choose how much to borrow after privately observing the shock that is realized at time t. And so I don't need to have the expectation the government knows what is the shock theta t that has realized. And the second key uh, difference uh, between the government welfare and society's welfare is that I have this factor alpha multiplying uh, the utility of government spending uh, at time t. And so this is going to represent the government's deficit bias. So we are going to take this alpha parameter to be greater than one, and I'll talk about the interpretation of all of this in the next slide. Let me say that for the talk, I'm going to make some assumptions. We don't need these assumptions, and we don't make them uh, uh, from the beginning in the paper, but I just want to simplify things, uh, given that we don't have a lot of time. So for the talk, I'm going to take uh, log utility, and I'm also going to make an assumption on the distribution function of the shocks, uh, which is related to an assumption that uh, we have used in previous work, and it's also related to an assumption that Ivan uh, has used in his work, but let me not talk about the technicalities. So let me uh, stress the, key, uh, the three key features of our model. So as I said before, there are going to be two main frictions. So the first one is that governments are going to be deficit biased. So what is the idea here? Well, the idea is to think that when a government is in office, it can derive private benefits from spending. Uh, for example, it can divert some resources to its preferred spending categories or its preferred constituencies. And so the government is going to overvalue current spending compared to future welfare relative to society. And, uh, of, of course, in the future, when the government is not in office, it cannot derive these private benefits. And so that means that moving forward, the government at time t is going to share the same preferences as society for fiscal policy in the future. The second key friction is that the realization of the shock at time t is private information of the government in office at time t. And so there are different ways to interpret this assumption. Uh, you could think that the government in office has superior information, for example, about the cost of public goods. Uh, more generally, what we are saying here is that policy at time t does not condition on the history of past fiscal needs above and beyond what is captured by past fiscal policy decisions. And so these uh, fiscal variables are going to be more easily quantifiable than the history of past shocks. And of course, the third key feature of our environment is that governments have full discretion uh, when setting policy. And so this is going to be a setting where any uh, fiscal policy rule that we could think of uh, should be self-enforced. So it's going to be self-enforced by the behavior of future governments uh, that you know, may, take different, uh, may choose different policy uh, depending on the behavior of past governments. Uh, of course, uh, we could also think about what happens if society can impose some uh, exogenous penalties on the government, and in this case, we could have some uh, formal enforcement of a rule, and that's something that we have also studied, but for this paper, we are just going to focus on uh, what can be self-enforced in an equilibrium. All right, so uh, we want to study equilibrium in this setting, so let me think about strategies first. Uh, for the government at day t, the strategy is going to specify what is the government's choice of debt as a function of the history of uh, debt choices and as a function of the shock that the government observes in that period. 
And given, of course, the government's uh, choices of debt, this is going to pin down the choices of spending. Uh, so let, I'm denoted here by omega t, the resources that are available to the government at time t, the, given the uh, tax revenue and the debt uh, that this government inherits. And so then using the budget constraint, uh, we get what the spending at time t would be. So an equilibrium is going to be a profile of strategies such that each government in each period t is going to maximize its welfare uh, given the strategies of future governments. And so given an equilibrium for any history uh, of uh, debt choices ht minus one on or off path, we can write the continuation value to society in a recursive way. And that's what I have done here on the slide. So we have vt of ht minus one would be this continuation value. And in fact, everything can be written recursively, so that's what we're going to do. It's going to be very useful to solve the model, and so from now on, I'm going to drop these time indices. And so the idea is that instead of optimizing of, over a whole debt sequence at any point in time, I'm going to think of assigning the government a level of debt, prescribing the government in this equilibrium a level of debt as a function of the uh, government's privately observed shock, and a continuation value. Where, of course, uh, this must satisfy the constraints uh, to be part of an equilibrium and where the continuation value would be itself drawn from the set of continuation values that can be sustained in an equilibrium. And so I'm going to show you all those constraints in a minute. Um, uh, in our model, we have that this uh, continuation value uh, that I have defined is going to admit a highest feasible continuation value that I'm going to call V upper bar and the lowest feasible continuation value V lower bar. These are the highest and lowest values that can be sustained in an equilibrium and which are going to be a function of the debt with which we start at a given period. Okay? And just one more piece of notation. I'm going to call uh, for a government with uh, resources omega and a shock theta. I'm going to call BP of omega theta the government's preferred level of debt, namely the level of debt that maximizes the government's welfare, conditional on this government being prescribed the lowest sustainable continuation value moving forward, given its choice of debt. Okay. All right, so now we are ready to write a recursive formulation for the equilibrium. So when do I have, as I said, we are going to think recursively, so think again at any given point in time. I'm thinking of prescribing a level of debt for the government as a function of the government's type, namely it's privately observed shock, so that's B of theta. And um, I don't know if I should do anything with that. Uh, and I'm going to be prescribing the government a continuation value given this uh, B of theta. And so what are the constraints uh, that this prescription must satisfy to be part of an equilibrium? Uh, I'm writing them here. So the first constraint is the private information constraint. This constraint is going to reflect the fact that the government can take a private deviation and essentially mimic a different government style, so pretend that the shock has been a different one. And so it has to be that the government prefers its, its prescribed level of debt and continuation value to those prescribed for any other shock uh, theta prime, right, for a government of type theta. The second constraint here is the limited commitment constraint. This constraint reflects the fact that the government can also take a public deviation. As I said here, governments have full discretion in choosing policy. So in principle, the government can choose a level of debt that this equilibrium does not prescribe for any government type, for any shock that can be realized. And so it has to be that for a government of type theta, the level of debt and the continuation value that we prescribe are preferred to choosing a different level of debt that is not prescribed for any government type. Now, because this is a public deviation, this can only occur off path, it's without loss to punish such a deviation with the lowest feasible continuation value. And hence, the relevant constraint is one that says that the government prefers its prescribed policy and continuation value to choosing its preferred policy conditional on being assigned the lowest continuation value. And finally, I have some feasibility constraints on the level of debt that we can assign. This is to keep uh, payoffs bounded. And I also have, of course, the constraint that the continuation value that we prescribe must be itself be drawn from the set of continuation values that can be sustained in an equilibrium. Okay? So this is just a recursive formulation of uh, an equilibrium in our setting. And so what we are interested in is in characterizing the best equilibrium for society. So this is going to be the equilibrium that maximizes social welfare at the beginning of time. And so that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, let's call B minus one the debt with which we start at time zero. 
And let's uh, now think of omega as being the available resources that we have at time zero. I'm going to be thinking about what is the prescription of policy and continuation values that I want to have in order to maximize social welfare and given that I want this to be an equilibrium, okay? So now I have, I have this very complicated uh, infinite horizon uh, model. I have a state variable, uh, which is captured here in the omega. That's where the debt that I start the period with is going to be. Uh, but we, with this recursive formulation, we have simplified things to just uh, solving this program, okay? Now, as you can see in the feasibility constraints, I have this V lower bar. So I'm interested in not only in characterizing what is the highest value that we can, um, uh, that we can obtain in an equilibrium, but also what I want to understand what is the lowest value that we can obtain. And this is going to be relevant because of that constraint, but also given the construction that we are going to derive. And so we can simply now uh, write such a program. So this is the program that solves for the worst equilibrium that gives me the lowest possible value that we can uh, sustain in an equilibrium. Uh, basically, I have the same constraints for this to be an equilibrium, but now I'm minimizing social welfare instead of maximizing it. Okay. All right, so the problem we are interested in is solving for the best equilibrium that I show you here. Uh, in the presence, again, of this deficit bias and the private information. The deficit bias uh, is going to uh, appear in this alpha, uh, which says that, again, governments are biased towards current spending. The private information is going to show in the fact that I have this private information constraint. But uh, before I solve this, I want to convince you that the combination of these two frictions is actually quite important to explain what we see in practice. And so it's going to be, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So BP is very simple. It's simply saying if I'm going to, it's, it's here, it's defined at the bottom. So it's saying it, uh, what is the uh, piece for punishment? So what is the government's preferred level of debt? Uh, yeah, given that I'm going to assign you the lowest possible continuation value, conditional on your choice of debt, of course, because what is the lowest and highest sustainable value moving forward depends on the level of debt that you choose, and that's a state variable. Okay, so as I said, it's going to be instructive to understand what happens if I remove either of the two frictions uh, that we have in this model, either the deficit bias or the private information. And this is going to be quite simple. So if we remove the deficit bias, that means that I'm setting alpha equal to one, so governments share the same preferences as society, well then trivially the best equilibrium is going to be one where governments choose the first best policy in each period, namely the policy that maximizes social welfare. And so that means that on path, we're always going to be at the highest value, so the continuation value will always be V upper bar, the highest that uh, we can uh, sustain in an equilibrium given the level of debt. And so that means that we are restarting the equilibrium in each period. Right? What happens if I have a deficit bias, but I don't have private information, so shocks are observable? Well, think about the program that I showed you earlier. That means that basically I can ignore the private information constraint, and the only thing I need to worry about are public deviations, right? So the government choosing a level of debt that was not prescribed, and we can see that that happened. Well, in this case, then, we can show that also on path, we are going to always be at the highest possible uh, value that we can sustain in an equilibrium. Either we are going to be, um, um, either the governments are going to also be choosing the first best uh, policy in each period, if that can be enforced given the limited commitment constraint, or if that constraint binds, we are going to have the lowest level of debt that is enforceable given that constraint. But in any case, we are restarting in each period, so we always have the highest continuation value at each time, again, given the level of debt. And so what this is saying, uh, uh, to sum up, is that if I consider a setting where there is either no deficit bias or no private information, I'm not going to have any history dependence of that, of course, conditional on the level of that, right? So that uh, the policy is going to uh, always depend on the level of debt that we inherit, but conditional on that, fiscal policy is going to be history independent. So there is nothing that we can explain of the form of fiscal policy regimes, as I try to motivate, that we do see in practice. All right, but what happens if we combine these two? Now we do have uh, a deficit bias, so alpha greater than one, and we do have private information, so the private information constraint, so things are going to change. And so I'm not going to uh, show you how we uh, solve things because we don't have the time, but I'm going to show you the results and try to give you some intuition. And so the first result that we're going to show is a bank-bank result. 
So what we are saying here in this proposition is that at every history on or off path in the best equilibrium, we are going to have that the continuation value is going to be either at the lowest or highest sustainable level given the level of that, okay? So we are always going to be at the boundary of the uh, value set. And so this bank one property is necessary for the maximization of social welfare. This proposition is saying that if I have an equilibrium that prescribes an interior continuation value, well, that equilibrium is going to be strictly dominated. And the key intuition here is that, as we are going to discuss uh, in a few slides, we want to provide governments with incentives uh, to, uh, you know, to sustain the, the best policy that we can for society. And high power incentives, by using the highest and lowest continuation values, are going to be the effective way uh, of, of doing so. More technically, uh, you, know, you might think that this result follows from the fact that uh, welfare uh, is linear in the continuation value, and definitely that linearity has to do with the bank-bank result, but that by itself would not uh, yield a bank-bank result. What is important too is that punishments are joined. What does that mean? It means that if I want to punish the current government for a choice of policy by having a low continuation value, I will also have to punish society because that's the same continuation value for society. So in other words, if I want future governments to do something bad to punish the current government, that's going to also hurt society, right? So the combination of these two things is what gives this result. And as I said, um, uh, you know, the assumptions that I made are not needed for some of the results in particular. This result is very, very general and it holds uh, for generic short distributions. Okay, so what is this result telling us? Well, it's, it's telling us quite a bit. First, we already know we are going to have two regimes. Okay, so either at any point in the best equilibrium, we are either at V upper bar or at V lower bar. So we were, either we are maximizing social welfare or we are minimizing it, okay? And so I'm going to call the regime that maximizes social welfare, that sustains V upper bar, the fiscally responsible regime. You will see why. And I'm going to call the regime that minimizes social welfare and sustains the lower bar, the fiscally irresponsible regime. You'll see why. So this is already telling us that if indeed the upper bar is greater than the lower bar, so namely the equilibrium set is not a singleton, okay? and if both regimes occur on path, then we are going to have history dependence because the policy that the government chooses is going to depend not only on current economic conditions and the inherited level of debt, but also on the regime that the government finds itself, okay? So that's how much we know so far, but then we have a lot of questions. So first, what is the form of policy in each of these two regimes? What triggers the transition from one regime to the other? And is it indeed the case that the equilibrium set is not a singleton, that I have the upper bar greater than the lower bar, okay? So let me try to provide answers to all of those questions. And for this here, I'm defining something analogous to the BP uh, this is called BR, R for reward, which is the government's preferred level of debt conditional on being assigned the highest feasible continuation value given its choice of debt. I have assumed log utility, so actually BP and BR are the same here, but more generally they can be different, okay? So we are keeping it generally there. Okay, so let me now uh, show you what is the form that fiscal policy takes in the fiscally responsible regime, namely when we are maximizing social welfare and sustaining the highest possible uh, value for society. And what this proposition says is that this fiscally responsible regime takes the form of a maximally enforced deficit limit, which can be characterized by these two thresholds, theta star and theta double star. So instead of showing you formally what this means, I'm going to try to explain it with this figure. And so this is just a representation. I have on the x-axis a uh, theta, namely the shock, which is the government's type. And then the left graph is showing uh, the level of debt that we prescribe for the government conditional on the shock. And the right graph is showing the, the prescribed continuation value. And so here what we have is this threshold uh, type theta star. And let me uh, uh, note here that we have uh, this level of debt, which is again a BR of omega theta star. This is the government's preferred level of debt, uh, condition on being assigned the highest continuation value. So this is what's going to happen in the fiscally responsible regime. Think of this level of debt. This is going to be what we call a maximally enforced deficit limit. So if the government chooses a level of debt that is weakly below that deficit limit, then we are going to stay in the fiscally responsible regime. So in the continuation, we are going to have the highest continuation value. So we reward the government for having that relatively low level of debt. 
But if the government chooses, and that's what the, the, figures, the figures are showing, if the government chooses a level of debt that is above this deficit limit, then we are going to move to a fiscally irresponsible regime, which is now the continuation that minimizes uh, social welfare. Okay? And so the idea here is this is exactly a deficit limit. And uh, so the idea is that I want to use these continuation values as reward and punishment for incentivizing the government to limit uh, their borrowing. Remember that the government is biased towards overspending in the present, but shares the same preferences as society for the future, because the government won't be in office then and cannot extract private benefits. And so promising uh, you know, the highest social welfare is a reward for the government, and threatening with the lowest continuation value is a punishment for the government. So this tells us that the equilibrium can take one of two forms. So going back to the figure, you can see here that uh, if the shock is relatively low, the government is going to respect this deficit limit, and we are going to stay in the fiscally responsible regime. But if the shock is above this other threshold, theta double star, well, then, you know, I know that I might set this bad precedent. We are going to move to fiscal irresponsibility. But given the current economic conditions, I still prefer to break the deficit limit. And so in that case, we will break the deficit limit for a high enough fiscal shock and will transition to fiscal irresponsibility. And so whether or not we are going to have these transitions, of course, depends on whether this threshold type theta double star is, uh, which depends on what is the value uh, that we sustain under fiscal irresponsibility, this V lower bar. Okay, and so that's what we want to solve for now. Uh, so let me show you the result. We want to understand now what is the form of fiscal policy when we are trying to minimize social welfare. So we are in this punishment phase. We are sustaining V lower bar. And what we show is that the fiscally irresponsible regime takes the form of a maximally enforced surplus limit. So this is like the mirror of what I showed you before, okay? So now I'm going to have a level of debt, uh, BR of omega theta star n, I'm calling it here. And I'm going to tell the government, if you borrow at least this level, right? So if you borrow high enough, we are going to go back to fiscal responsibility. So we are going to have a reward with the highest continuation value. But if you don't borrow enough, if you borrow below this level, we are going to stay in the fiscally irresponsible regime. And so what are we doing here? Well, remember, we are trying to minimize social welfare. And so we are incentivizing the government to follow its bias and overborrow. Okay, so that's, in principle, how can we minimize social welfare? Well, we could induce either too little borrowing or too much borrowing. But governments are biased towards overborrowing. So having the punishment, punishment be overborrowing is going to be more effective because this relaxes the constraints of the problem, okay? And so I want to punish governments by having this overborrowing in the future. Uh, it, it, that, that's what the fiscally responsible regime uh, looks like. And let me say that uh, this threshold above which governments, so again, we can see here that if the shock is sufficiently high, the government will indeed choose to borrow above, above this level, and we are going to move back to fiscal responsibility. This threshold is always interior. And so what this is telling me is that fiscal responsibility is always temporary. So you could think that the punishment is, you know, transition into static Nash and it's an absorbing state and we stay there forever. No, actually we can do even worse. So we can get an even lower uh, social welfare level by telling the government, if you overborrow even more, we are going to reward you in the future. Okay, so, so uh, we can hurt social welfare uh, sufficiently harshly by this overborrowing that it turns out that this is um, the socially optimal thing to do. So let me explain the dynamics. We are going to start, what, what do we get from these results? We are going to start in a fiscally responsible regime, right? We want to maximize social welfare. This takes the form of a deficit limit. If the shock to the economy is sufficiently low, we are going, governments are going to respect the deficit limit, we stay in this regime. But if the shock is sufficiently high, the government is going to break the deficit limit and we are going to transition to fiscal irresponsibility. So what we see is that following a high enough shock, debt is going to persistently rise. What happens under fiscal irresponsibility? Well, think of this as a temporary abandonment of rules. Governments are following their biases. They want to overborrow. If the shock is sufficiently high, then the government is going to overborrow sufficiently enough that we are going to go back to fiscal responsibility. But if the shock is sufficiently low, then the government will not borrow so much, so we are going to stay under fiscal irresponsibility. And so what we have here is under a high enough shock that is going to persistently decline. And so 
what we obtain here is that fiscal policy is characterized by these two regimes that are punctuated by crisis periods, right? So the, what I show you uh, for post-1970s for the US, we see that following a high shock, this is uh, like a crisis period. This is when we move from one regime to the other, and we have the stance of fiscal policy persistently changing. So the last thing I want to show you is that, well, everything that I said so far is true, so long as I assume that the upper bar is greater than the lower bar, so namely the equilibrium set is not a singleton. But when is this the case? And so what we do in this part of the analysis is now we do use the log preferences for this. Uh, and the log preferences, uh, you know, welfare is separable in the level of debt. We can show that the difference between the highest and lowest values uh, given an initial level of debt is simply equal to a constant independent of that level of debt, and that simplifies things. So we can exploit the single dimensionality of this problem now, and we develop a factorization algorithm to characterize uh, uh, P star, which is uh, the difference between the highest and lowest uh, values that we can sustain in an equilibrium. So basically, we characterize P star as the fixed point of an operator function. And uh, this is similar for those who are uh, familiar with APS. This is similar to the factorization algorithm that they, uh, that they derive. Uh, of course, their setting is one of moral hazard with finitely many actions. We have adverse selection with a continuum of actions and shocks. And so it's quite different. And moreover, we are going to apply this algorithm very differently. We are going to do uh, what Pierre likes calling reverse APS. So instead of starting from the highest uh, value set that we can uh, sustain, we are going to start from the lowest. So we're going to start from uh, a static Nash equilibrium, namely P equals zero. Uh, governments are just choosing their preferred level of debt. There are no rewards and punishments. And we are going to see as we raise P above zero, do we converge to another equilibrium, uh, to another fixed point uh, with P greater than zero. We show that if we do converge to some uh, fixed point P greater than zero, that's going to be the best equilibrium for society, and that's the unique one. And what's good about this is, is that we can show conditions under which this is true. So this is the last result I'm going to show. And so this is what we find. Um, so this proposition says the following. When are we going to have fiscal policy regimes? When are we going to have that the equilibrium set is not a singleton? Well, clearly, the discount factor has to be high enough. If governments don't care about the future, there is no way that I can use these continuation values as reward and punishment to incentivize governments to limit their borrowing. Okay, so that's, that's pretty obvious and it's, it's not that interesting. But the most interesting part of this proposition is that to have fiscal policy regimes, I also need governments to be sufficiently biased towards current spending. So there is going to be some alpha tilde strictly greater than one, such that if the deficit bias is below this alpha tilde, we are not going to have fiscal policy regimes. If the deficit bias is above this level, then that's when fiscal policy regimes can emerge. And in fact, for a range of parameters, they will, we will have transitions between regimes on the equilibrium path. And so the idea here is that uh, for the threat of fiscal irresponsibility in the future to be credible, I need the governments in the future to be sufficiently willing to overborrow, okay? And that can only happen when governments are sufficiently biased towards current spending. And so, as I said, um, this allows us now to go back and think about uh, the dynamics that I show you, but let me uh, just say that in the conclusions because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, so we have characterized the best equilibrium interaction between successive governments. We showed that there are these endogenous transitions between fiscal responsibility and fiscal irresponsibility. Uh, these, uh, these are persistent changes in fiscal policy that follow high spending shocks, so basically uh, crisis periods, and I show you that these transitions can only occur if governments are sufficiently biased towards current spending. So as I said, we want to use this to think about the dynamics that I show you for the US. So post-1970, I show you that we had these different periods. We want to think of these periods of fiscal consolidation, again, as fiscally responsible behavior by governments that uh, limit their overborrowing because they don't want to set a bad precedent for future governments to overborrow in the future. They understand uh, that uh, overborrowing today would trigger that overborrowing in the future. Of course, if the economic conditions are such that setting this bad precedent is not as bad as not responding to these conditions, then governments will then uh, choose to overborrow and will move to uh, uh, this debt build up periods, this fiscal irresponsibility. And so we are going to interpret periods of debt expansion as fiscally irresponsible behavior by governments who enjoy overborrowing, they derive benefits from overborrowing, and they understand that once the deficit becomes large enough, fiscal responsibility will be reinstated. 
But as I said, pre-1970s, we saw that we didn't have these fiscal policy regimes. And so what we're going to do is interpret this uh, pre-1970s period as a period of low political biases, low deficit biases, and the post-1970s as a period with uh, higher biases. And this is uh, something, as I said, that the political economy has highlighted, the political economy literature has highlighted that political biases have increased over time, that this can uh, explain the increasing uh, uh, debt levels across advanced economies. And what we show here is that this can also explain the presence of regimes in fiscal policy. And we could think of different extensions, but I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. And now we have a discussion, uh, Mark Aguiar. Okay, great. Uh, oh, I should hold this, huh? Uh, no, if you're oh. uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, honoring one of my heroes. Um, and this, has been a, this is a great paper to discuss. Uh, I really enjoyed this paper. I read it, you know, since I read it uh, a week or two ago, I've been thinking a lot about it. I, I uh, had dinner with Fernando in Princeton uh, on Monday. I bugged him about it. I've been talking to Manuel about it. I've, it's actually, there's just a lot of ec interesting economics in this, and, and I'm happy to discuss it. Um, so let me just say, I, I'm going to first like, just talk some details, and then I'll, I'll step back and put it in perspective. So this goes back to the lunchtime conversation that uh, uh, Marina mentioned as well. So you think about a government that suffers from present bias. There's some private information about the value of spending. OK, so solution one. So Avon has a, you know, lunchtime Avon didn't like rules, but actually this Avon did. Um, he has a beautiful paper. Uh, think about what to do in this situation. Well, if it's a, a low theta, you know, so the, they don't actually want to spend a lot, you let them do it. Uh, but then there's a hard cap. And in their paper, there's a full commitment to this rule. There's just no way to exceed the cap. And there was, you know, they had a bunch of results, one of which was that there was no money burning, there was none of this, there was no um, punishment, really. Uh, so this is the, the policy that, uh, I just took the policies, I didn't take the values. So the, just looking at the left hand, the left hand side, uh, for them, they didn't have this theta star star. It went all the way over. So you could do what you want for low thetas, and then there was a hard cap, and then you were stuck at that cap. Oh, sorry, should you step yeah. If you step away. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna step away. Uh, so that was their result. Um, okay. So then you can say, well, what if you can't force these guys to follow the cap? What if there's some limited commitment problems and people are going to exceed the cap? Um, you could have some kind of punishment. And, and Marina and Pierre have an earlier paper, very nice paper. You impose the cap, but then you know that if that is big enough, they're going to exceed it. And so. Um, So you're going to get this picture, this left-hand side picture. You, these guys are going to exceed it, and you're going to punish them. And the punishment is socially costly. There's some subtle feature here is that you don't want to go halfway with the punishment. You, it's the bang-bang nature. The way I thought of it, maybe it's the wrong intuition, but you're kind of here, and these guys are going to exceed the cap. Why would you have an interior punishment? You could, ex you could uh, make the punishment worse. They wouldn't exceed the cap. You could extend this region. You can always kind of extend this region until you run out of space. Then you have to go to the most severe uh, uh, punishment. So that's kind of take two. Uh, that's nice, but where do these punishments come from? Maybe there's some legal environment that you're appealing to uh, that's, uh, that can punish. This one says, OK, let's. Drop the limited, uh, uh, let's drop the commitment. So there's still, we still have limited commitment. Let's drop this ex exogenous punishment so we can't appeal to any kind of uh, judicial punishments or whatever. Um, all you can do is have an endogenous punishment mechanism within the confines of the decisions that we're modeling, the fiscal, in this case, fiscal policy. Um, so this is, uh, we get this, 
cycle where, you know, everything is fine if you're below theta star star. Then you might get a very high theta. The government says, I'm going to exceed the cap and go crazy. And then next period, you go to the punishment. And the punishment takes this, this form where these guys get to spend all they want. These guys actually ha have to spend more than they would like to. So this is this forced spending. Um, these guys are actually uh, uh, responsible, but they're doing the wrong thing because they're not punishing these guys. So these guys get punished the next period. Um, but everybody else above, um, uh, above this threshold spend a lot, and then we go back. Okay, So we have this cycle. Um, let me just see. So it's a stick uh, carrot type uh, punishment is very s similar to these. Uh, how do you inf um, have a cartel uh, a la Green and Porter? Uh, by overspending, the next government punishes today's. Punisher gets rewarded by going back to the best uh, uh, rule, and then failure to punish gets punished. Okay, so it's an avenue towards the harshest, uh, harshest possible punishment. So these uh, breakdowns are actually part of this equilibrium that's sustaining this, this uh, best equilibrium. Okay, so that's kind of the economics of what's going on. But let's step back a minute and say, what are we trying to do? So we do see countries oscillating between responsible and irresponsible policies. We see it in fiscal, monetary, trade, uh, all sorts of things. So, and then you know, a lot of my work has been on emerging markets. It's taken to an extreme there. In fact, when I was writing the, the Cycles of Trend with Gita, we talked a lot about policy regimes driving these shifts in growth regimes. Okay, so here are just some examples. Here's the U.S. debt that Marina showed. Um, here's the great inflation in the U.S., right? We kind of lost, you know, the, the gold standard Bretton Woods broke down. We kind of lost this uh, uh, low inflation. We went to this uh, uh, high inflation, and then Volcker came. We kind of recovered it, and then we had this recent experience. So we do see these cycles. Here, I, since we're honoring an Argentine, I thought I, I should put an Argentine. Actually, there's interesting cycles beyond the big spike, but it's such a big spike that you can. So this is, Argentina is one of those cases where you have to take the log of the log change um, to really see it. Uh, and so anyway. I think it's, it's a well-motivated question. We would love to understand why we have these cycles. Um, so the stuff that I've done and other people have done uh, starts with kind of thinking about state variables, endogenous state variables. And one of the, you know, the, 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 the avenues I've explored is debt overhang. You come in with a lot of debt, and it tempts you or forces you to do crazy things. Tax capital, maybe, inflate, expropriate. Uh, you know, it's just there, and, and it needs to be addressed, and it, and it creates bad policies. And then you can think about why would debt uh, fluctuate over time, and you could have business cycles affecting the path of debt. So, a boom, you can pay down some of your debt, put yourself in a better position, but then you might end up back because of recession. But these are very driven by observable state variables, uh, very Markovian in that way. Um, Another avenue that people have explored is learning, right? People do crazy things. Maybe we didn't know the true model. We we're doing the best we could at the time, and then we make mistakes, at least in retrospect. Uh, but we're learning along the way, and we might fluctuate. So Sargent's Conquest of American Inflation, we're kind of learning about whether the Phillips curve is exploitable or not. Uh, um, Paco Barrera, uh, Monge, and Primaceri have a very nice paper on, on I think motivated by Latin America, learning the wealth of nations, what is the right policy? Is it pro-market uh, policies or socialist? And you can get these cycles. Um, so that's one way, that's an alternative way to go. Okay? There you would like to think that we eventually learn the correct model, and there's many environments where that actually happens, but not all. Okay, then I'd say a third way to approach this is to think about reputations. So you want to bring in this history. Past fiscal decisions affect borrowing terms. Hall and Sargent have a great uh, series of papers on US fiscal history about how we built credibility, starting with the Revolutionary War, by paying debt. 
Uh, Crucius and Trebus have a great paper. Uh, here is just the spreads that countries face uh, after they've restructured, they had defaulted, they've restructured, they've gone back to the market. Uh, and the spreads they face depend on the haircuts that they have on the last default. Now you could say, well, obviously histories must matter in this kind of thing, but it took us a while to find a good plot like that, and they did it, because uh, you need to factor in a lot of aspects. So histories do seem to matter. And you can think about a standard reputational model. They're good governments, bad governments. We can't figure out who they are. We're trying to tell by their actions. They try to mimic the good, you know, the bad type tries to mimic the good type. They might do that for a while and then abandon it, and then you realize they're a bad type, and you get these cycles. These are actually um, hard models to work with, uh, but it is, I think, how most kind of casual uh, discussions of, of these markets uh, uh, have in mind this kind of, there's a reputation, are there, are you, have you proven yourself a good type or a bad type? And then you can talk about the costs and benefits of misbehaving. If I misbehave today, I'm going to get punished in the future from the markets. And it's very much this kind of type reputation models. This paper, I think, does a lot of that, but it takes a different approach or it takes a middle ground. Histories matter. Bygones are not bygones. We pay attention to what people have done. Perfect. Um, but the shocks are IID, okay? But the bad behavior triggers sw a switch to a bad equilibrium next period, and then we revert back to uh, good behavior. And that's a feature of the bad equilibrium. It's not that, uh, you know, we, we know you're a bad type and you get cut off, okay? Or failure of good behavior is a feature of the, of the best equilibrium. It's just going to happen along the equilibrium path. And this, I think, is a very nice, nice approach. Um, all right, so comments. You know, the paper is super clean. You can see things. Uh, it's a difficult problem, but they handle it beautifully. Uh, it shows how bad behavior can be endogenously punished. And they show the exact form the punishment takes, the worst punishment takes. And it's a success along typically, you know, how we want to measure economic models. It can replicate these oscillations in policies. We see breakdowns of political norms, uh, and certainly that, that rings true. Uh, you break down a norm, and then bad things happen. But then norms are reestablished, okay? Why is that? Well, they have a coherent theory for this. So this is a nice, coherent, tractable model that explains this, this somewhat elusive empirical pattern. Okay, so let me just say, like, what I really struggled with is thinking about this is how do we actually coordinate on a very particular type of equilibrium? Especially this fact that if, you're, if you have an a irresponsible fiscal policy and then the next guy is actually responsible, that person gets punished. Um, you think this is a very, you know, hard coordination. Why not reversion to static Nash? It seems very simple that, you know, a, a political, social norm or an institution is a bit like pottery. You break it, you think, how am I ever going to put this back together again? Once it's gone, it's gone. It's very easy to envision that. The odd thing is, is that we do put it back together, right? We do reestablish uh, the norms again. And static Nash won't do that, right? You break it, it's gone. Uh, here, in this model and in the data, it seems like we get back. You know, after Burns, we had Volcker. Um, after uh, uh, Reagan, we had uh, Clinton. Um, so it does, it does seem to match this empirical pattern. So it would be great to just walk through some of these historical examples and think through, how did we coordinate on this punishment equilibrium? Like, what kind of signals, like in the narrative maybe, that tells us it's this, rather than a learning story or a, rep, you know, a canonical reputational model? Um, and how do we coordinate on the best equilibrium? You know, this model has many equilibria. In all these uh, types of models, we, we tend to like to gravitate towards the best. We, we have sometimes appeal to some metagame where we've gotten to the best somehow or it's sustained. But it would be nice just to understand how did we get to the best. And then some countries, obviously, you're wondering, I don't think they're at the best equilibrium, uh, even though they cycle. So what is it that, that tells us this? 
All right, so very elegant paper. The economics is, is subtle but crystal clear. It generates something that we see in the data that we'd like to understand. It has a very coherent uh, uh, model to explain it. It's very thought-provoking and provocative. As I said, it's, it, it kept me up thinking about it, which is a, which is a good thing. Uh, and so uh, I highly recommend it. I'm just going to leave this on. Sure. Thank you, Mark. I think we have a few minutes for some questions, if there are. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm missing uh, a key stylized fact, and that is that many countries, in the world economy generally, has a tremendous thirst for U.S. liquidity. So the government finds it very easy to continue to have deficits. So where is that in this picture? Um, many countries uh, put them in their reserves, right? U.S. paper. Um, um, and about another comment about the Clinton years, well, Clinton presided over a boom. So the boom meant higher government revenues and lower debt. So that's very, that is not really uh, uh, so much of a policy move, but rather uh, what the economy produced in terms of government finance. Thank you. Should I respond now? Okay. So first I want to thank Mark for an overly generous discussion. Um, um, I, I think it's a great suggestion to think a bit more carefully about how this coordination happens. Uh, for us, it's uh, very intuitive that, you know, you, when you are in the, under fiscal irresponsibility, you get the, the deficit becomes very large, and that's, you know, like when things are like really bad, that's when we put like the pottery together, as you said. Uh, but like trying to understand really how is that coordination happening in specific cases, I think, I think that would be good. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the, the question about the, uh, the, the, you know, some economies wanting these uh, uh, deficits or like benefiting from these deficits. Definitely what we are thinking about here is that there is some first best uh, level of debt that depends on the economic conditions. So for sure it's not that we want zero deficit, right? Uh, but the, the problem is that these governments uh, additionally get some private benefits uh, from, from spending in the present. And so we are always uh, trying to counteract that bias to overspend whatever the first best uh, deficit would be, if, if I understood correctly. I'm, I'm not sure. Take uh, two examples. The U.S. and Greece, the U.S., the last data you have there for debt, is very similar to the Greek debt when the Greek had to, Greeks had to go into default. And they spent 10 years in recession, in depression. 25% fall in income, over 25% unemployment. The U.S. with the same level of debt, nothing happens to it. How do you explain that? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think that's outside the model. <laughs> Definitely. I don't know what this model can say about that. Um, we could try to think of some of these primitives being related, but I, I don't think we have a lot to say about that, that specific fact. So I, I thought the presentation was excellent and the, the paper looks great, um, not, not surprised. Uh, sitting where I'm sitting right now at the IMF, I'm sort of scratching my head a little bit about what this means for, for us. Um, <laughs> if, if a country deviates from um, you know, its path and then the punishment means that there needs to be more irresponsibility, uh, in the next periods, then maybe we're going at it the wrong way. Um, so I'm curious what you think about. Yeah, about I, I think that's a good point. So um, 
So as I said here, we wanted to understand, I think of this as being more a positive theory, so we wanted to understand this behavior, try to explain uh, these patterns, and think about you know, what can be self-enforced, and, and could this explain some of the things that we see? But when thinking about policy, I think we want to think also what happens if we have some tools uh, to, to affect this equilibrium, right? Uh, and so, as, as Mark uh, uh, noted, we have a, a previous paper where we think that, you know, the IMF or as, as some authority would have some, uh, some tools uh, also to uh, influence policy. And, and in fact, if you think, for example, um, that you have some exogenous penalties that you can impose on a government uh, for breaking a deficit limit, uh, then uh, what I, I show you about the optimal form of policy in the fiscally responsible regime would still go through. And so what that uh, result is telling you is that you would want to use all of the tools that you have, uh, the largest penalties that you can impose, and think of this as a deficit limit. So in particular, you want to give, uh, going back to you know, uh, Ivan's work, uh, as Mark cited, you want to give government some flexibility below the deficit limit. So you know, this is just a limit. You're not saying like, how much they must borrow at, at every point, uh, but, but you just set the limit. So some countries have, uh, some governments have, uh, have flexibility depending on, on the co economic conditions. But but then if we break the deficit limit, you want to go with all your force there and, and penalize them as much as you can. And so that's what we show in that paper where we have you know, uh, some uh, penalties that we can impose. We don't think, you know, what we are trying to, uh, uh, to highlight here is that, uh, going back to Ivan's work, this uh, perfect enforcement is hard in reality, right? And so the first thing that we did was to say, okay, you have limited enforcement. You can do something, but you cannot kill uh, the person if they, if they break the deficit limit. So, so you can do something, and that what, that gives you uh, this Bankman result. You want to use all of your tools, and you still want to do a deficit limit. Here we go, uh, as Mark said, another uh, step of thinking, okay, you don't have any tools. What is going to happen in the economy? So I guess what this paper is, is telling you in the, your current position is that if you don't have these tools, this is how the economy may respond, right? So the extent to which you can uh, now you know, reduce these periods of fiscal responsibility, if you have some penalties that you can impose, then we don't need to have uh, such uh, large endogenous punishment. We can substitute, right? We would want to use all of it, but I think to some extent, uh, given how harmful this endogenous punishment is, uh, you, could, uh, you could change that behavior. So uh, I think, uh, if anything, it tells you you need to have more power. <laughs> A quick uh, question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, sir. Uh, so the, the first uh, fantastic paper, but I was sort of on path, so that's uh, no, no surprise. But I, I, have, I think I have a very good comment. How do I know it's a very good comment? Because I think it was 10, 15 years ago in the summer camp in Buenos Aires, Atkinson and Kijo, I think Andy Atkinson presented paper. It's sort of like a simpler setup, but it has something similar in the sense that, you know, you had to sustain the best equilibrium, understanding how the agents, there was the private sector agents, how they coordinate their expectations, and you know, and the, the best equilibrium is a hard thing to, to think. So Guillermo uh, uh, was in the audience, and sort of uh, after the paper he says, okay, so what you're learning here is what had to teach people. <laughs> because you know, you had to teach people how to, how to think about deviations, because it's not that, you know, there's a ton of equilibrium you had to somehow go to you know, IMF school or something where you tell them this is the way you interpret them, right? Because the whole thing is that this is how one government interprets that the actions will be, you know, given how the, how the government understands that the actions now will be conditioning how the actions of the future governments will be interpreted. And I remember Guillermo saying, yeah, you had to go to some sort of a school where they tell you how this is, just to think about the, the subtleties of that. I don't know if you remember, Guillermo. I, it really, I mean, I, I remember it well. So this is like, a, it's a one choosing exchange rates versus a flexible versus fixed. Sorry, it wasn't a, a question. No, 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 I think that's a good point. I mean, as, as we say, these regimes, I mean, you have a threat of transition into fiscal irresponsibility that helps you sustain fiscal responsibility, but I totally agree. Governments need to understand that this threat exists. Uh, the same way that governments, uh, you know, we think that they understand once things go crazy, the deficit becomes large enough, and their fiscal responsibility, they also know, okay, uh, they will, you know, fix the pottery, I guess, was the, the analogy. Um, the organizers have allowed five more minutes for questions. So I see Robert, uh, uh, Ricardo and, and Roberto. Maybe why don't we take the two questions, the two questions, and then you can answer both of them. Okay? Sure. 
Okay, uh, very quickly, uh, very interesting paper, but I'm a little worried that when you are in the irresponsible regime thing, there could be an immediate reform to jump into a better regime, right? And uh, that has to do, uh, since we are uh, in a conference about time inconsistency, about the question of renegotiation. There could be a renegotiation issue you know, at each point in time when you're in the irresponsible regime. So uh, that has to do with some of the issues, like for example, why don't you consider like reversion to Nash equilibrium and so on? Right? I mean, that's probably something that might actually help you understand, you know, in some sense, the fragility of, that kind of, of this kind of analysis. Let me take the last two sure. questions and then you answer. Yeah, you know, I, it sounds like a, a beautiful paper. I, I had a little bit of trouble with two parts of it. I want to under, get a better intuition of why it is that um, if you're in an irresponsible regime, you would be punished for behaving responsibly. And when is it that you're in an irresponsible regime and it's in your interest to switch and pay and behave responsibly. Okay. Um, oh, no, one, one I, I, I will start forgetting. One okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful modeling. And, but, but in honor of, of Argentinity, of yours and of Guillermo, I, I, I was wondering on the succession of irresponsible regimes in practice and uh, in, in the model, when you punish, you also punish society. Right. There, there may be a political economy interaction that underlies a potential different equilibrium. If society, if the medium voter didn't go to the IMF in the Fernando, in the Fernando school theory, uh, he may be somehow myopic. If you put a, uh, an electoral, uh, mechanism behind, and the punishment is big enough, the necessary punishment is big enough, the, you may deviate, and the electoral process may elect a declared irresponsible because it doesn't, it's not easy to identify who's who. What does it mean, responsible or irresponsible? I don't know if, uh, if this is a bit in line with the idea of Guillermo, you should teach the people the so that could explain that there is no correction. Right, so I think, I mean, I think these are all great questions. I won't <laughs> remember the details of each of them. Uh, I think most of them are, are asking about the, this punishment phase and, and how do we think of it, which, which you know, we agree. I think, uh, uh, you know, we, we want to think of this best equilibrium for society as a benchmark. That's typically what we do when we have these models, right? We don't necessarily need to say this is exactly what is going to happen. It is very telling to us that this benchmark actually can explain what we see in reality, and so that's why uh, we think it's important, this idea of punishment being temporary and so on. Uh, renegotiation, you know, would always be uh, an issue, of course. But what is important to remember here is that, and, and that this is a, a key feature of the model that you know, we think we have a lot of evidence for, is that governments themselves are deficit bias, right? So we are not saying, uh, you know, now you need to overborrow. we are forcing the government to do that. The government wants to overborrow. So the difficulty here is incentivizing them not to do so. And when we get to fiscal responsibility, what they're doing, what we're doing is telling them, follow your bias, right? Forget about deficit limits. There is no deficit limit, just abandon the, all the rules and follow your bias. And the idea, the way I interpret uh, what this equilibrium is saying is that there is an understanding that if I actually borrow enough, the deficit becomes large enough, you know, then the future governments will have to do something now. So they, then they will have to put it together. So that's what we see here. And that is what uh, provides this reward for the overborrowing. Uh, and think, uh, I don't know if I answered all of these questions, but uh, more or less that's, that's the idea uh, that we have in mind. Yes. Ah. So I think that in default, so that was one of the extensions that uh, you know, I had there and I, I didn't say anything. Uh, that's something that has been in our minds that we could think about in the future. I think actually default would be uh, something like adding to the punishment in, in principle, right? So, so the same way that exogenous uh, penalties could do. If you have a default, this is going to be even more harmful, right? Uh, once you break the deficit limit. So if anything, it's going to allow you to sustain a better 
uh, equilibrium, a, a more responsible, fiscally responsible, fiscally responsible uh, regime. Uh, but, but there could be other sub subtleties uh, specific about how you model the, the default, which we haven't looked at. I, I think that would be a great extension. Thank you.